Thank you, Senators. We'll move to question time. And the first question is, oh, sorry, Senator Wong. Yeah. Uh, I seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Do you want one? I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Senator Watt will be absent from question time today for personal reasons. In Senator Watt's absence, ministers will represent portfolios in accordance with the letter circulated to the president and party leaders and independent senators. I'm happy to run through the list if any senator wishes. Thank you. Um, senator Birmingham. Oh, sorry, I, th I didn't know if you were responding. No, no, not no, to that. Okay, so we'll now move to question time and the first question is to Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer to the release of ministerial diaries by the Attorney General and the Treasurer detailing their first 100 days in office. The Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus, has said, and I quote, I'm going to continue to work with colleagues and across the public service on making sure that there is as much transparency as possible about our government information and ministerial diaries. Minister, given the commitment of the Attorney-General to create as much transparency as possible about ministerial diaries, why is the Prime Minister refusing to release his diary, putting him at odds with his own Attorney-General and Treasurer? Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, there is obviously a FOI. I assume these are FOI claims not, uh, or requests, um, not um, one of the many orders for production that uh, seems to be occurring on, uh, at the moment. Uh, obviously, uh, every uh, freedom of information request is distinct, has to be considered on its merits, and every minister will have to respond to requests in a manner that is appropriate to appropriate to those individual circumstances. So uh, I'm not the FOI decision maker, uh, but uh, I know that uh, FOI decision makers obviously will have to make a judgment on the basis of the merits of the application before them. As Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, sir. Thanks, President. Minister, does the government have a policy, a government policy, regarding the release of ministerial diaries? If so, what is it? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister Wong. Well, the, the government observes the provisions of the uh, Freedom of Information legislation and applications are processed in accordance with that legislation. Uh, that's, that's the, that's, well, that's the appropriate, well, that is the appropriate way in which uh, uh, these, these matters should be dealt with. Uh, second uh, second su supplementary, thanks, Senator Birmingham. Mr. President. Is the minister representing the Prime Minister aware that FOI applications for ministerial diaries remain outstanding for some other ministers, including herself? Will the Minister for Foreign Affairs be releasing her diary and adopting the Attorney-General's approach to transparency, or will she be joining the Prime Minister in thumbing her nose at the Attorney-General? Uh, minister Wong. Thank you, uh, well, and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, here we go Order. again. Senator Birmingham's newfound interest Order. in transparency. I bet you didn't release yours, did you, mate? Uh, you didn't release yours, and not, nor did anybody release. Nor did anyone release the ministerial list that showed the secret ministries that the Morrison government was engaged in. Nor did anyone release uh, the details Order. of Senator McKenzie using spreadsheets. Uh, to allocate government monies, nor did anyone release how it is that you, you funded car parks, car parks uh, which people didn't want. So you know, the Australian people, uh, I think, will look at you and your questions as a former member of the leadership group who helped cover up all of this, uh, cover up all of this, and they will look with a, with 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 a very clear eye at the at the hypocrisy on the other side of the table. Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Point of order. But on, on the question of direct relevance, uh, President, on the question of direct relevance, the minister has spent 51 seconds talking about the former government yeah. to a question about whether or not she would comply with an FOI request for her own diary and just meet the same standards as the Attorney General or uh, thumb her nose you, like, the, like the PM you've, has. You've made the point of order. I'll uh, direct uh, the minister to order. Order. Senator McGrath and Senator Birmingham, I, 
Senator Birmingham, I'm responding to the point of order. Minister, I'll direct you to that part of the question. Thank you. Decisions will be made in accordance with the Freedom of Information legislation. Yes, Thank you. Sir. Order. As Senator McKenzie, when you've quite finished, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Vietnam, and I know they've met um, many senators and MPs across the parliament. Um, the delegation is led by His Excellency Mr Wong Din Hue, President of the National Assembly. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Yeah. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. How is the Albanese government delivering on its plans for a better future for all Australians? Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator Payment for her question. And I say this, after a decade of wage suppression, of spiralling childcare and healthcare costs, of ideological wars, which are still occurring, and an out-of-touch former government that thrived on secrecy and cover-ups, Australia did need action, and this government is delivering. We're working to get made wages moving and putting downward pressure on costs. And from our first day in office, our support ensured an increase to the minimum wage and a pay rise for aged care workers. Albanese Labor are investing in cheaper childcare, in cheaper medicines, paid parental leaves and secure jobs with better pay. I take the interjections because when you talk about secure jobs with better pay, there's nothing that gets the Liberals moving more than that, is there? They hate it. They hate it. And we're acting to make workplaces safer from sexual harassment with the passage of the Respect at Work Bill based on recommendations which were left unfinished. And we're ensuring Australia has the skills of tomorrow. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, creating 180,000 new fee-free safe places. We've expanded the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card. We've ended the cashless debit card. We've established a Royal Commission into robo debt. We have delivered the Regional First Home Buyers Guarantee. We've passed an historic climate change bill and updated our climate targets. You should listen. You might learn something, Senator Rustin. We've invested in renewable energy and rewiring the nation. We are establishing a disaster ready fund, a vital tool as we battle floods across, the, across Australia. Uh, we have entered the cover up culture, and now uh, uh, the majority of whom refused. The, the majority of those who Order. refused Order. To, to censure their former leader. Order. Where were all of you lining up to defend him? <clears throat> and of course, the Nanti National uh, Anti Corruption well. Commission. The, correct, the na National Anti-Corruption Correction that you spend years Senator trying Wong. to avoid, years trying to avoid, Senator now Wong, passed your under seat. an Albanese Labor government. Before I call um, Senator Payman for her first supplementary, I am going to remind senators, particularly on my left, that you are being incredibly disorderly. You are shouting so loud that I cannot get the attention of Senator Wong. It is unacceptable, it is disrespectful and it's disorderly. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. Um, Minister, how is the Albanese government delivering on its plans to help Australians with the cost of living? Minister. Uh, Senator, McGrath, Senator McGrath, as one of the key offenders, I have not even called the minister and you've started interjecting again. Minister Wong. Thank you. The Albanese Labor government is addressing the cost of living crisis created under the Liberal and National government with our cost of living plan, Ke cheaper childcare, cheaper medicine, expanding pay parental McGrath. leave to six months, more affordable housing and getting wages moving. You, you know, these are all things you could have done, but nine years you didn't do them. We have already secured an increase in the minimum wage and an important pay rise for aged care workers and our secure jobs, better pay policy will boost wages even further. We on this side understand the impact higher energy prices are having on households and businesses. But you know, we're actually going, we're actually trying to work on how we, we support households to do that, how we have a response. You know what your response was? 
Let's hide it. Let's hide it. Let's hide it before the next election. Order. Let's make sure no Australian Order. knows about the hike, the hike in fees uh, while we're in government. Let's hide Senator it till after Kenison. the election. What a disgrace. Uh, Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, Minister, how is the Albanese government delivering on its plans to make us more influential and stronger in the world? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, thank you to the Senator. And I, I know this is an area uh, that in which she has such a great interest and, per, and personal knowledge. And you know, What we saw over the last nine years is slashing of Australia's development assistance. Uh, we saw uh, Mr Dutton you know, returning to the sort of rhetoric uh, around development assistance in the House at this, this, this sitting period, and really that was a disgrace, uh, because this reduced our influence and it left a vacuum for others to fill, and we have a lot of catching up to do. So that is why we are committed to renewing our closest relationships and advancing our interests and values. That's why we're boosting Pacific security and defence, supporting critical infrastructure, expanding Pacific labour mobility and why we have increased Australia's official development assistance to the Pacific and Southeast Asia because it is in our national in interests. We are rebuilding relationships to ensure Australia is the partner of choice in the region for our security and for the security of our region. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cadell. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer you to the, uh, yesterday the answers you gave regarding the secret, secret government modelling in a document titled Estimated Impacts of CFPS and Associated Coal Mine Closures, dated October 2020, which details almost 800 job losses in the Hunter Valley alone associated with government policies and the closure of mines. In April this year, the now Prime Minister, when visiting the Hunter Valley mining communities, was quoted by the Newcastle Herald under the heading, Anthony Albanese guarantees no jobs will be lost on the road to net zero. Can the minister advise if the Prime Minister stands by his guarantees? Good question. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. Uh, uh, I thank the senator for his question, and, and uh, I, I did have the opportunity to follow up some of what he asked yesterday uh, overnight. And, and I'm advised that the closures he, in fact, talked about were announced under your government. Oh. Yeah. They were announced under your government. So I do find it, I do find it somewhat passing strange uh, that you try and make political mileage as you are doing, and you did yesterday, about a closure that was actually flagged under you. Uh, now, that's probably a fact I should have been aware of, and I, I'm grateful to my colleagues and to the departments for letting me know that. But uh, these are closures that were flagged under the uh, former Senator coalition McGrath. government. Um, obviously, uh, we are working with the New South Wales government, which I note has also has a 50% well has a 50% emissions reduction target by 2030. So I look forward to your criticism of them, if that is in fact the way you want to approach this, uh, to ensure the Hunter and other regions benefit from new jobs and opportunities in clean energy. And one of the differences between those on that side uh, and those on this side of the chamber is that we want to look after workers. Yeah. We want to look after workers. Yeah. You know, you know, we're a movement and a party that has. Workers Senator at, McKenzie, at our core. Senator Davey. Uh, and uh, yeah, I know it's hard Senator for those McKenzie. who spend so much, so much of their time arguing against pay increases and telling us the sky is going to fall in if there's a dollar pay increase, and saying we can't afford to give aged care workers or those on the minimum wage an increase. Uh, but those on this side understand there is a transition that is that that is occurring that is occurring and will occur as a consequence of what is happening in global markets, as well as what is being committed to, Senator I think, McKenzie by both sides of Senator government. Davey. So the difference between you and us is that we will ensure that there Thank is a you, transition that is expired. about employment. Uh, Senator Cadell, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you for that. In the same Newcastle Herald article, when referencing the Prime Minister's guarantee, the Prime Minister's quote is saying this wasn't about policies, but I quote, not only can we guarantee it, our modelling guarantees it. Does the Prime Minister stand by Labor Party's pre-election modelling, or does he accept the official government modelling says Labor's policies in the Hunter will cause 800 job losses? Good question. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. Well, I, I, I again remind, um, 
I again remind Order. those opposite uh, that the closures that uh, were are referenced were announced under you. So I find it a little, uh, I find it a little interesting uh, that, and I think many will, that uh, those opposite who have all you, you want to have your cake and eat it too, don't Senator you? Birmingham, Senator Mackenzie. There's a running commentary from the left-hand side of the chamber every time the minister speaks. Now, not only is that disorderly, it's also incredibly loud. And I would ask you to listen in respectful silence, minister. <laughs> respectful, disrespectful silence, just a bit of le le less noise might be helpful. But anyway, um, uh, look, uh, th th there is a transition uh, that is occurring uh, in our economy and globally. And oh, would you like to speak, Senator McGrath? Senator, Senator McGrath? Well, I, I don't, that, you've got plenty Canavan. of opportunity to speak if Senator, Senator Cash ever Canavan. sat down, I suppose. Senator Cash might, might actually give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, Leave is granted. You use up. Order. Canavan. Senator Canavan, resume your seat. Senator Canavan, resume your seat. Order. Order. Order on my left and my right. Order. I have a senator on her feet. Senator Rice. President, we denied leave for Senator Canavan to rant on about coal mining jobs and destroying the planet uh, in Senator the meantime. Rice, Senator Rice, it's not order. Order, Senator Ayres and Senator McGrath. I'm sorry, uh, Senator Rice, there's so much noise in this chamber. I only heard the voices to give Senator Canavan leave. I did not hear um, anyone say he was denied leave. Um, Senator Cadell, I believe we're up to the second supplementary question. Thank, Thank you, you, President. Uh, the model that the Prime Minister relied on to make those false promises of job guarantees to the people of Hunter, is that the same modelling the Prime Minister and the government used to prom promise 97 times before the election that Australians will see a $270 reduction in their power bills? If that is the modelling, how can anyone trust what the government and the Prime Minister says? Good Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister, I didn't actually call you before you started. Um, Minister Wong, thank you. Apologies, uh, President. Um, uh, well, I'd make this point uh, if you want to talk about um, you know, truthfulness. Uh, those on your side are signed up to the same target we are for 2015. Senator Rustin. Uh, this, is a, this is a policy and a political point. You are also signed up to net zero by 2050, remember? And I know you want to talk about that a lot in Kooyong and North Sydney. Didn't help. Well, this is, goes to policy. This goes to policy. Meanwhile, Mr Canavan, Senator Canavan, gets up and gives that rant, which shows that it was all fake. It was all fake. You thought, you thought you could say one thing in one place and one thing in another. Well, we are really clear. There is a transition that is occurring, a change in the global economy. Order. We either get ahead Order. of it and we help workers and communities thrive in that, or you keep going to them and lying to them, misleading them about what is happening, because you're signed up to the same policy. You just Thank don't have you, anything Senator to back Wong. it. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi. For climate change. In 1991, Vanuatu, on behalf of small island states, 
first ask the question, who should pay for climate catastrophe? Over the next three decades, wealthy nations of the global north dodged and deflected that question while continuing to fuel the climate crisis. They relentlessly pursued profit and power, putting the world on track for climate catastrophe and fueling climate disasters. These disasters have affected 33 million people in Pakistan and 50 million people in the Horn of Africa face the threat of famine, amongst many others. After decades of pushing by the Global South, a loss and damage fund has finally been agreed to. New Zealand, Denmark, Germany and Scotland have already committed to contributing. Will the government today commit to paying our fair share of loss and damage? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. We, we, are, we are committed to uh, an effective global response on climate and, uh, as Mr Bowen made clear, we, we welcome the historical progress made in I'm just, I'm just, uh, if you want to waste your question time, I'm happy for you to do so. <laughs> um, um, uh, we welcome the. I'll start again. We welcome the historical progress made it made in agreeing to a new loss and damage fund, and uh, the parties have committed to exploring. Senator Rustin, this is a question from Senator Faruqi. I think the least you could do is listen in silence so that the answer can be heard at that end of the chamber. Minister Watt. Senator McGrath, interjections from you are particularly disorderly. Senator Wong, please continue. Uh, we are pleased that the parties have committed to exploring a broad range of ways to provide support to vulnerable countries, including those in the Pacific. We have heard our Pacific family uh, when they've said the region's loss and damage needs are distinct from the adaptation and resilience. Uh, and as you know, we are actively working with Pacific partners to consider new climate finance options, including on loss and damage, and to ensure global funding mechanisms work for the Pacific. So uh, there is a, a, a quite a, there's a, an engagement, a willingness to discuss. Uh, and I would, I, would make, I, would, I would make this point. Um, uh, because I know the Greens come in here and they want us to do this, but they also want to reduce revenue uh, uh, from from other sources, uh, such as such as well, you know what what do you think happens if we end ex what do you think happens if we end coal alcohol exports? Exactly. What do you think happens if we? I mean, this is, but but what I would I would make this point that the the order order. <laughs> Order. Senator Thorpe, I've called the chamber to order. Minister, please continue. Uh, I, I, I simply uh, uh, make this point. Uh, it would be much better uh, for the country if there was bipartisanship on development assistance. Uh, I regret that that was lost under the, those opposite and appears to be continue to be lost. Thank you, but Minister, I would invite them to reconsider that. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Uh, Minister, as you well know, the climate crisis is an existential threat to the Pacific, where communities are facing rising sea levels and extreme storms. The government claims to be listening to the Pacific Islands. Well, the Pacific Islands have waited decades for loss and damage funding that is owed to those nations as a matter of global justice. What will your government do to ensure that a fund is established urgently with no room for backsliding? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister. Well, you know, you know I, I, I'm interested in the motivation, the implication about our motivation in that. Uh, because we are motivated genuinely. Well, we are motivated. We had a long discussion Senator yesterday Faruqi. about motivations. Senator McKinn demanded something be withdrawn. I notice you did put it on social media afterwards yeah. anyway, but that's OK. Uh, but I would say to Senator, Senator Faruqi, the implication that we're not genuine in our engagement with our Pacific neighbours is wrong. We are. Now, that, that does not mean there is not a lot that we have to work through, and I have been up front with them. I have said we are a, a highly emissions-intensive economy. We are, we are seeking to shift the trajectory, uh, the direction in which we're heading, and we are, we are doing so belatedly. It will cost us more and it will be harder because of nine years of inaction. Exactly. But we are serious about doing it. 
Uh, so please, if there, if there was an implication, and perhaps I misheard, that somehow we are not genuine in how we engage with the Pacific, and we, because we understand the nature of the threat, thank you, uh, Minister. It is your incorrect. time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. The climate change minister tabled his climate change statement earlier today, but failed to even mention the elephant in the room: the impact of new coal and gas on Australia's climate targets. And yet, the latest greenhouse inventory also released today shows emissions from gas are increasing. Does the government acknowledge that burning coal and gas is causing and fueling the climate crisis? And why won't it rule out opening new coal and gas projects? Uh, thank you, Minister. Well, uh, I, I've, been answer I've answered this question many times. Excuse me. Uh, I understand this is the, the political campaign that the Greens party wishes to run between now and the next election. If I may say, that's a decision for you. But actually, the policy challenges are far greater, are far greater. So you can have a mantra around that, but actually what we need to do is transition an economy uh, which is not only emissions intensive domestically, uh, but is reliant on emissions, high emissions intensity, intensity industries for much of our export revenue. Now we have to transition the economy, change the economy, so our, our, our people, our children, our country can thrive in a net zero world. That is an enormous undertaking. That is. Senator Thorpe. You see, I'll, I'll take that interjection. I'll take that interjection because, as I said to Senator Milne years ago. You know, it's possible that people might just disagree. It's not because, Thank because you, we corrupt Wong, your time has expired. Senator Wong, your time has expired. Senator Sewell. Democracy. You're only one voice. Order. Voices. Order. One voice. Senator O'Neill. Oh, I'm sick of it. Senator Sewell. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. As we come to the end of 2022, the tourism sector is hoping for a Christmas that sees Australians able to travel in a way they haven't been able to in recent years. Can the minister outline the steps the Albanese Labor government has taken since being elected to support small and medium-sized tourism businesses recover from the impact of the global pandemic? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Um, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, I thank uh, Senator Stirl. Uh, very interested in the topic of tourism and uh, comes from that great state of Western Australia. Well, yes, the Albanese Labor government is supporting the tourism and travel sector's recovery in a way that the former Liberal National Government never, ever did. We know the vast majority of tourism businesses are small and medium-sized. They collectively make a significant contribution to employment and our economy. To support this sector, we are delivering on our commitments, including through a $48 million um, investment over four years. And we are directly Colbert. engaging industry to address the challenges that they face. In August, we held a Tourism and Jobs uh, Skills Summit to hear from industry about the challenges they face. We have launched a visitor economy disability pilot. We're working on a project to better connect workers and employers in the industry. In October, I hosted a ministers, uh, meeting, tourism ministers' meeting in South Australia uh, with state and territory uh, counterparts to collaborate on support for the industry. And I look forward to the next meeting, which will include the tourism ministers from the re-elected Andrews Labor government. In October, we launched the Come and Say Good Day campaign to get international tourists back to Australia. Already, 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 Senator Stirl, it's attracted 122 million views, uh, which translated to a 74 per cent increase in traffic on Australia.com. And last month, no, I'm going to I'm going to come to the Bellarine in Mornington. Don't worry. Don't worry, Senator Henderson. Not in this question though. And last month, last month, we launched the Caravan Parks Grant Program to help park operators upgrade their facilities. The, uh, the uh, uh, Albanese Labor government stands the, uh, understands the challenges we have faced in tourism Thank and you, travel, Minister, your and time we are has committed. Expired. Senator Searle, first supplementary. Just done the whole... <laughs> wow. First supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, can the Minister outline further details about how the Albanese Labor government is helping small and medium-sized tourism businesses address labour and skills shortages so they can recover and thrive? 
Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, and uh, Senator Still, yes, I can. Uh, in August, uh, we held a Tourism, Jobs and Skills Summit to hear directly from industry about labour and skills challenges. You never held one. You never held one. In, in September, we announced $3.3 million to establish a visitor economy disability pilot to help people living with disability secure sustainable jobs in the tourism industry. The pilot uh, will address barriers identified by small and medium tourism businesses in recruiting, retraining, retraining and, pro and uh, progressing staff with disabilities. Uh, we are working with the industry on a project to provide a one-stop shop for showcase showcasing career pathways, connecting employers with prospective workers and providing workers with information on jobs and upskilling opportunities. We want to see tourism workers return to this sector after they were forced to look and find work elsewhere under the Thank previous you. Liberal Thank you, National Minister, Government. Your time has expired. Senator Searle, second supplementary. I do. Thank you, President. Now, Minister, in your earlier answer, you touched on the Caravan Parks grant program to support businesses to improve their caravan parks. Can the Ministry outline how park operators, whether on the Mornington or Ballerine Peninsula in, or in tropical North Queensland, or more importantly, Outback WA will benefit from this program. Minister, uh, thank you, President. And uh, yes, I can uh, outline that, uh, <coughs> Senator Steel. And thank you for your great interest in this uh, topic. The Albanese Labor government is committed to supporting tourism businesses, including caravan park operators, to recover, grow, and thrive. And President, I know that uh, Senator Stirl and potentially even Senator Henderson would be pleased to hear that applications Senator, are currently not just open for caravan parks across Senator the Mornington Henderson. and Bellarine peninsulas. Applications will not just be open in a tropical far north Queensland or outback Western Australia. Grants are open for park operators all the way across Australia. And I can assure you that there will be no colour-coded spreadsheets from this government. The $10 million caravan park grant program will provide grants of between $10,000 and $100,000 to help eligible park operators upgrade their park yeah. facilities. As we move into the holiday period, I wish all those working in the tourism Thank industry you, Minister. a Your happy time and has safe expired. Christmas. Order. Order. I wish to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of Mr Sean Turnell, who I'm sure we're all uh, so thrilled to see safely back in Australia. <laughs> and of course, we also welcome his wife, Dr Harvu, who we know um, fought long and hard for his release. And on behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Yeah. Um, Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, can I uh, say how pleased I am to see you in person, um, and Dr Harvu as well. I know I speak for all Australians when I say we are so pleased to have you um, back here in Australia with us, and so pleased that you have been reunited with, uh, with her after 21 months of unjust detention. And I would say to you, we know no one should have had to endure what you did, and that you've emerged from such an awful experience with your humanity and humour intact uh, is truly remarkable. Um, I want to acknowledge um, the work of all those across the government who work so hard on your release. Uh, the including the former government and Senator Payne uh, here in the chamber. Uh, and I thank, uh, again, publicly, um, all the members of ASEAN who, all our partners in ASEAN um, and other regional partners who advocated for your, your release. We are, we're grateful to them. But most of all today, um, welcome to the Senate, um, to both you, Professor Turnell, and, and also to Havu. As I said, I've spoken to both of you, but it's lovely to see you in person. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. I thank the Senate and, uh, and Professor Sean Turnell, Dr Harvu. We also warmly welcome you, Professor Turnell, back to Australia, safe and sound. We thank you for the way in which you have always conducted yourselves, each, each of you, uh, particularly noting that your engagement in Myanmar 
was one to help uplift others, to deliver for others, and that the price you paid was an immense one. Uh, I, too, associate the opposition with the remarks of Senator Wong in thanking all of those who worked so hard to secure your release, and we know that you will continue to work hard wherever you can for the people of Myanmar. Thank you, Senator Waters, uh, Birmingham. Um, I'm now going to move to Senator Tyrrell. Uh, yes, Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education, Minister Gallagher. Um, the ALP national platform commits a Labor government to ensuring that disadvantaged schools get the biggest funding increases in the shortest time. Does this government stand by that promise? Minister. Thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question and for her advocacy on behalf of um, children uh, and uh, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds who require um, for assistance and support through their schooling years. Uh, yes, the, Labor, the answer to the question is yes. The Labor Party um, has clearly, you know, through our platform, outlined our position on education. We are the party that introduced needs-based funding in recognition of uh, students um, coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, whether that be where they lived, whether they had uh, learning disabilities, whether they came from non-English speaking backgrounds, First Nations children, the recognition that um, in certain schools that the resourcing of those schools need to accommodate the student populations. Um, so we have a long and proud history of that. Um, and you know, I know that Minister Clare is working very hard in terms of the next round of negotiations with states and territories about how to best um, meet the commitments we've had outlined in our platform, but you know, the position that the government has taken around ensuring that the education system, mindful of the fact that the states and territories have a significant role here, and the independent and Catholic sectors also uh, educate large numbers of children and, and young people, uh, that we do recognise disadvantage and try to structure our funding accordingly. Um, but I also know from my previous role that education funding is a very contested issue uh, about um, how, how the resourcing is applied. It's not easy, it's not straightforward, but we remain deeply committed to ensuring that every child, regardless of where they live, where they come from, what their parents' incomes are, get access to the best education possible in this country. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you. Independent special assistance schools are a special stream of schooling that exists to provide education to the most socially and economically disadvantaged children in Australia. Your government's 2023 changes to funding calculations will see their budgets cut. They're not getting the biggest funding increase in the shortest time. They're getting funding cut right now. How is that not a broken promise? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. Uh, thank you. And I, I have um, uh, seen the reports about the situation in Tasmania, uh, Senator Tyrrell, and um, I understand that the Jackie Lambie Network or you and Senator Lambie have raised concerns about what is happening under this funding model um, and how it's uh, how that, those decisions are flowing onto schools. I also know that you, you've met with the Minister for Education um, regarding the issue and that um, the advocacy on behalf of this, the Jackie Lambie Network on behalf of those schools in Tasmania or in, in particular school. Um, as I understand, the Minister told the Senator that this is a scheme created under the former government. However, when it was brought to his attention about the impacts of that scheme and how they were flowing through to schools. He did ask the Department of Education to work towards resolving the issue, that this work is happening and he is working with some urgency. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Thank you. These schools are really important. My nephew was actually on an 18-month waiting list and he had to leave Tassie to go to Victoria to get educated. But the schools are making decisions about which staff to let go right now. They're asking you to reverse this decision urgently. I understand that we're working towards it, but it really does need to happen to its suite. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell, Minister. Thank you, yes. Um, I, as I said in my previous answer, acknowledging what Senator Tyrrell has said, I understand the Minister is working um, on taking advice around what to do about this. I don't know that 
Um, I don't know. The, well, I don't know the specifics about this, the funding um, scheme, uh, but I don't know that it's having the intended. The consequences of how it's rolling out aren't what was intended, as I understand from this scheme. Uh, the minister is taking advice. He's had a number of meetings with Independent Schools Australia to understand their concerns about the scheme that, that as I said, we inherited from the former government. And when a resolution is reached, um, the Independent Schools Australia and any impacted schools will be informed direct, uh, directly. And I also understand from running a school system that schools will be taking decisions now in the lead up for the calendar year and the next school year. And uh, the minister understands this as well. Thank you, minister. Um, Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Climate Change, Senator Wong. Uh, since the Labor government's first budget four weeks ago, in which the government had no response to the immediate energy price rises, various government ministers have publicly flagged export controls on gas, price caps on coal and gas, a new mining tax and direct energy subsidies to households. Other than publicly floating different policies, can the minister finally provide some certainty to Australians, to industry and to investors by ruling out... Order. Order. It's Senator. very hard. I'm just I'm struggling just to get the question out yep. here. It's very loud over there. So. Senator Bragg, I have called senators to order. Order. Thank order, senators, on my right. Don't you think? Yeah, I thought you'd agree. Uh, uh, so, other than publicly floating different policies, can the minister finally provide certainty to Australians, to industry, to investors, by ruling out intervention that would only make a difficult situation even worse? Thank you, Senator Bragg. Um, minister. Which one uh, of the well, uh, I'm asked a question about policy certainty. I'm asked a question about policy certainty from the coalition. I'm asked a question about policy certainty from the coalition on energy. How many energy policies did they have? Was it one? Was it two? Was it ten? Was it twelve? Was it fifteen? Was it eighteen? Was it twenty? Was it twenty-two? Oh my goodness, twenty-two policies! And surprise, surprise, the market said, well, we don't want to invest when well, we don't even know what the policy framework is. So we saw dispatchable energy out and we had less energy in. Prices started to increase. There was a default market offer with an increase. Guess what their great certain policy response was? Let's hide it. Let's hide it. I tell you what, I've got a great idea, says Scotty Morrison. And Angus, they all sit there in a room, maybe with this one here, with Senator Birmingham. I'm sorry, Mr. Morrison and Mr. Uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, and and they said, "Yeah, let's do." Oh, we know what we'll do. We'll just hide it. That's what we'll do. That's our great policy response. Uh, and then we come to government and we see the mess. And yes, uh, and yes, we are we are we are working our way through your mess, which has got worse. Uh, order on my left. Senator Birmingham. Senator Birmingham. Uh, se uh, Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, and, and then, and then uh, we, we, we come to government and what we discover is a hidden price increase. Uh, we discover an energy market which is on the, on the, on the edge. Uh, all on top of all on top of what is occurring in global energy markets, which Senator Rennick says are irrelevant, uh, but uh, Senator Birmingham stood on this side and told us all about. So we are we will work through this, and we will work through this with the states. Uh, thank you, Minister. But nobody on that side can. Uh, Senator Bragg, first supplementary. Order, Senator, Senator Gallagher. Wong. I've worked in risk markets all my life. Senator Bragg. <laughs> Senator Gallagher. Hi. Senator Hi. McAllister, yeah. order. That's Senator right. Bragg. Sunday. Thank you for. Just call me Sunday. <laughs> order. <laughs> Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. 
Uh, the Queensland, New South Wales and South Australian governments have all expressed opposition to price caps on energy. Will the government rule out price caps that just risk deterring energy investment and exacerbating the current shortages for many years to come? Thank you. Senator Bragg, Minister. Uh, well, uh, like, uh, like, unlike those opposite, we do understand the importance of policy certainty uh, and we do understand the importance of working with the states. Uh, and as the Prime Minister uh, said, uh, I think last night on 7.30, uh, we, are, uh, we will work through these issues, uh, including uh, with the states uh, and obviously the National Cabinet. Order. Order from everyone. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Senator Mackenzie, I've just called the chamber to order and you just continue calling out. Uh, Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, we will work through this issue with the states. And of course, it is, it is, a, it is a difficult issue. Uh, you know, we, don't, uh, we don't shy away from that. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are dealing with a, a legacy problem or we're dealing with a global markets problem. And you know, my, my, or what I would say, Senator Bragg, if, is if more on your side understood some of those policy issues, I suspect the country would not be in the position it is. Um, Senator Bragg, second supplement. Thank you very much. Uh, this week at Senate Estimates, both the Treasury Secretary and the Governor of the Reserve Bank said that Australia needs more gas. Why did the government cut supply-side policies in its budget? And can you name one government policy that aims to increase the production of Australian gas? Thank you, Senator Bragg. Minister. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure to what uh, I, I'm not to, I'm not sure to what the minister is referring. Uh, sorry, the senator is referring. Uh, and uh, I order, order. The minister has the right to be heard in silence. Please continue, minister. Uh, I gave I gave you a promotion. You see, I must like you, Senator Bragg. Um, uh, I'm not sure what, to what you're referring, Senator Bragg, but I, I, would, I would make a point about um, gas supply. Between 2014 and 2021, East Coast gas production increased. Wow. Order. Oh, it's always someone else. Senator Van. <laughs> Order. Plus, it's always someone else. Uh, Senator um, Van, you lost the ele state election, mate. Just maybe, just give it a rest um, for a little Minister, while. Minister, please continue. Um, uh, between 2014 and 2021, East Coast East Coast gas production increased 300 per cent, because, in, in great part, because um, the Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Just on uh, on relevance, the question went to policies, uh, not statistics, historical statistics uh, that the you, minister Senator is Canavan. referring to now. The minister now. is being directly relevant. Minister, please continue. Oh, no. Well, I'm making, I'm making the point about, you might not like to know this, that the, despite the 300 per cent increase in gas, coast, gas production, uh, domestic gas prices went up by 420 per cent in real terms over that time. So the point is the policies you had failed. That's the point. Thank so you, Minister, we are trying to work our way through that. A Senator Babette. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Health Minister, Senator Gallagher. The recent release of Australian Bureau of Statistics provisional mortality data for our nation shows all-cause mortality to the end of August is currently a staggering 18,671, or 17 per cent higher than the historical average. Now, a report which appeared in the Lancet Medical Journal also shows that Europe is facing an increase in cancer diagnosis after an estimated one million cases of cancer went unfound due to the COVID lockdowns and other draconian measures. Can the minister advise what we are doing here in Australia to make up for the many thousands of likely missed cancer diagnoses over the last two years? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Babette for the question. And uh, we, are working with, we are working with the states and territories. There is no doubt. I mean, I, I, haven't, um, I don't want to align myself with the uh, mortality data and this, because I haven't seen what you were citing from. But the broad, well, that's fine. I, 
I'm not questioning it. I'm saying I haven't seen it. So my question, my answer is in relation directly to the question, not the preamble. So the question uh, was, what are we doing? There is no doubt that our health services over the last two years were significantly affected by the, the pandemic. So services um, that would normally be provided through hospitals, people going to GPs, people actually even seeking health treatment uh, because they, they had a concern, uh, significantly changed during the pandemic. We are working with the states and territories, as you would expect through the National Health Reform Agreement, um, about um, you know transitioning out of the pandemic and the COVID focus. Um, there are, you know, they'll have significant um, pressure on the hospitals, but also in primary care. Um, and as people come forward, um, there were there is no doubt there was delayed seeking of health um, attention or seeking of health assistance and access to services through the pandemic. Uh, and we, it will take some time to work through that, but we are working with the states and territories through the uh, Prime Minister and the First Ministers um, through National Cabinet about um, pressures in the health system and transitioning away from, from COVID-19 and the COVID-19 focus. Thank you. Uh, Senator Babette, first supplementary. Deaths with COVID-19 generally not solely from COVID-19 have been recorded by the ABS as 7,000 727 at the end of August. Even if we exclude all deaths with COVID-19, we are still seeing excess deaths of about 10,944. Can the minister explain or advise what research, if any, is being done to look into the cause of this alarming excess, excess mortality? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Well, again, I haven't. Uh, thank you, President, and for the Senator for the question. Again, I haven't seen the data to which um, the Senator is referring, so I think it is appropriate um, that um, I don't um, just immediately accept those statistics. Um, but I think there will be, over time, a lot of information, a lot of research and assessment done about our response to COVID-19 and some of the other consequences of the fact our health system had to respond to a global pandemic and therefore other services were either wound down, didn't um, operate or people chose not to seek assistance during the pandemic. I have no doubt that there will be plenty of academics and researchers who are interested in that, assessing that and then um, making recommendations about what should happen when the next um, global pandemic um, hits, hits um, you know, the country or all countries. So that, Thank you, I'm Minister. sure there will be done. Has expired. Yes. Senator Babbitt, second supplementary. Now, we've seen some alarming data out of South Australia sourced by Senator Alex Antic, to my right, which shows a material increase in cardiac presentation in 15 to 44-year-olds commencing in July 2021, a time when there were very minimal COVID cases. What is the minister doing to investigate the un underlying cause of the spike in heart-related issues? Does the government still assert that the um, mRNA injections are still safe and effective? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I haven't seen Senator Antic's research either, and I'm not sure of your background in epidemiology and assessing, um, you know, what's the health trends during a global pandemic. But I, I can be corrected if you have some background in that. Um, in relation to, do we think the vaccines are safe? Yes. Um, the TGA has gone through its process. It's, it, as you know, Senator Babbitt, they also report on adverse events and myocarditis, pericarditis in younger people was one of the, the identified risks of those vaccines and everybody was, well, everybody was informed of that um, and it was seen as a risk. Those um, people where it affected them, particularly younger men, as I understand it, those adverse events uh, were recorded. Uh, but I should also say the vaccines have saved thousands and thousands of lives, particularly most vulnerable Australians, and the pandemic and the vaccine program uh, Minister, was always about responding expired. to that. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Minister for Women and Minister for the Public Service, Senator Gallagher. Could the minister update the Senate on the government's achievements across her three portfolios over the past six months? Uh, minister. Busy. 
Oh. I thought there was a longer question. Order. Order. I will. Order. I will. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Urquhart. Um, can I thank you for your interest in my three portfolios um, and for the question? It has certainly been a very busy time since uh, the Albanese government was elected six months ago, and we've spent every single day focused on implementing our plan for a better economy, better budget and better future. We've begun the work of budget repair, restoring fiscal discipline to reverse the decades of economic, or decade of economic mismanagement. That's right. In October, we delivered a responsible Senator budget King. that is right for the times and readies us for the future. It puts to an end the record rorts and waste that riddled Senator the budgets King. under those opposite. Investments in services and Senator programs Hume. that— uh, Minister, please resume. Uh, Senator Hume, I called you at least three times and you just chose to continue. That is incredibly disrespectful. I ask you to listen in silence. Minister, please continue. Sorry, I didn't hear the interjections. Um, I've, I've got a coping mechanism where I blocked them out. Senator McGrath. Okay. Um, investments in services and programs that matter to the Australian people, like childcare, like aged care, like cheaper medicines, like housing, like climate, investments. Well, there were billions of dollars in our Powering Australia plan. I take that interjection from you, Senator, Senator McGrath. McGrath. Our Powering Senator the McGrath. Australia Don't plan to fix the, the energy mess that we Senator inherited. Ciccone. The negligence of those opposite when they were in government to put their head in the sand and pretend that the most significant economic transformation and challenge facing the country just wasn't going to happen, that they didn't need to deal with it. Well, we're dealing with it in our first budget. We've also begun implementing the Buy Australian Plan, which is our plan to use the government's purchasing power to help grow Australian businesses, create jobs, develop up sovereign capability and back Australian businesses. Our spending review identified $22 billion in savings over four years to uh, deal with the budget. Uh, first you, Minister. Steps of budget Your time repair. has expired. When there's quiet, I'm going to call uh, Senator Urquhart for her first supplementary. Senator Urquhart. Can the minister provide further information about how the government has begun meaningful reform to shift the dial on gender equality and reduce the barriers faced by women in this country? Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank Senator Urquhart for the question. As Minister for Women, I'm very proud to say that gender equality has been at the core of this government from day one, because gender equality is a core Labor value. I don't need to convince my colleagues, men or women, that we needed to get moving on gender equality. We just get on with it. The Albanese government is putting gender equality front and centre of our economic policy. We're giving more women more choices through modernising and expanding PPL and making childcare cheaper. We released the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children under the leadership well, it was a very different plan, Senator Rustin, by the time it got signed off, let me tell you that, by the time the states and territories signed up to it. We've got our housing agenda. We're implementing respect at work recommendations, uh, including a positive duty for workplaces to prevent sexual harassment. And we're beginning work on the national strategy for gender equality, guided by the Women's Economic Equality Task Force. And there Thank is you, much Minister, more to do. Your time has expired. Senator Urquhart, second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. Can the minister provide further information about how the government has begun making the institution of the Australian Public Service stronger, more enduring and more aligned to the community that we are all here to serve? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Urquhart for the question again. Our government is building a stronger public service to better serve all Australians. We abolished the Liberal and National Party's arbitrary and damaging staffing cap that diminished the capability and capacity of the public service and led to an excessive and reflective reliance on wasteful external labour. We are reinvesting in the NDIA, in Services Australia and the Department of Veterans Affairs to improve service delivery for Australians. We have appointed a dedicated Secretary for Public Sector Reform 
to deliver on our agenda and have commenced an audit of employment to improve job security and save taxpayers' money. We have also restored the ability of workers and their representatives to bargain in good faith and be consulted. What about that? How radical is that? And I want to take this opportunity to thank the 160,000 pu public servants who have worked so hard to support the government deliver on our commitments to the Australian people. Uh, thank you, people. Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Prior to the election, uh, Prime Minister Albanese said to all Australians, I'll say this very clearly, they will be better off under a Labor government. He promised that a Labor government will see electricity prices fall from the current levels by $275 for households by 2025. But isn't it true that, according to your own budget, this December Aussies will have to pay 50 per cent more just to run the aircon, pump the pool and turn on the Christmas lights? I thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Wong. Take no responsibility. Well, uh, it, is, it, is, it is the case. Oh, sorry, did, did um, you call me? No, you I called you. I call you. Oh, uh, Senators, interjections across the chamber are particularly disorderly. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, it is the case that Australians are, are battling higher energy prices. Uh, and we know why that is. We know what we inherited and we know where global markets are. Uh, and uh, uh, well, I think you know you perfected the art of I don't hold a hose, mate. I'll take the interjection from Senator Rusk. She says uh, no. She says you yeah, don't take responsibility. I mean, we've got we've got your people in the house voting against the censure motion for the prime minister, the former prime minister, who who made an art form of never taking responsibility for everything. So let's be clear. Uh, about who has been prepared to be up front with the Australian people, who is, who is clear that we have, we have an Order. energy, we have a, a significant a, 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 a problem in our energy markets that the government is working through, which is, which is as a consequence of a, a nearly a decade of inaction and denial of 22 failed energy policies and what is occurring uh, globally. Uh, now, I know those opposite Senator don't Hume. like to be reminded of this, uh, but uh, the reality is renewables are the cheapest form uh, of, of power. Oh, I see. You see, this is, the, this is, if you ever wanted an example of why energy markets are where they are, it's because you are still locked into an ideological Order. battle, the vortex of inaction because of the fight between the Jared Rennicks uh, and, the, and the Andrew Browns. Uh, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Order once again on my left. Please continue, Minister. Uh, the, 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 the ideological vortex. Uh, that oh, is, though, Minister, that is... Please, please sit down. Senator Rennick, I have just called the chamber to order, and the minute the minister is back on her feet, you are interjection, interjecting. It is disorderly. Minister, please continue. Well, I'm actually happy to take Senator Rennick's interjections because I think what it demonstrates is, and so does the result in Victoria and the result of all of those seats uh, which were traditional Liberal he heartland seats, uh, that, that your ideological fight internally has put you out of touch with the market and where most Australians are. That Thank is the you, hard Minister. reality. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Thank you, President. In the coming weeks, Australians will be heading back home to their families and then off to a well-deserved break. Uh, some will be at the beach and some will head to the regions. Uh, isn't it true that they'll be paying more for their plane tickets, more for their bus tickets, and then uh, more for their snacks at the survey, and your government has no plans to fix it. Uh, Minister. Uh, so, uh, what we are what we are saying is this: uh, we will we are investing twenty four billion dollars to fix transmission and speed up renewable energy. We have heads of agreement with East Coast LNG exporters to deliver more, more gas in 2023. The budget had a package um, to give Minister, the regulators. The reg Minister, please resume. Um, Senator Sullivan. Point of order on relevance. My question went to cost of living. 
Yep, and I believe the minister is being relevant to that, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister. I'd have something to do with this. Uh, budget had a $67 million package to give regulators, including the ACCC, the AER and AEMO, more powers to monitor gas supply and take action. We've overhauled the gas trigger to allow it to be activated quarterly. If there is a shortfall, and force exporters to divert supply for domestic markets. These are all things you, you did not do. And we are working with the ACCC to strengthen the code of conduct between gas suppliers and customers to get reasonable prices in the market. Now, we know there is more to do. But unlike you, we are not engaged in an internal ideological fight between people like you who might have a rational position and Senator Rennick, who continues to argue uh, a position you, that Wong. reminds me of Senator the Flintstones. Wong, your time has expired. Order, Senator O'Sullivan. Order. Uh, order, Senators on both sides. <laughs> Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, thank you, President. Very soon, Australians will be gathered around the table for Christmas lunch. Uh, they will not be better off. They will have paid more for the turkey, more for the ham, more for the bonbons, more for the beers and or possibly the Prosecco, and more to get presents for the kids. Order. Is this what the Minister Order. for Employment meant when he said people will be seeing in their bank accounts what a change in government means? Uh, before I call the Minister, Senator Pulley, I've called the Chamber to order and you have constantly been interjecting throughout the time Senator O'Sullivan was at uh, order. Minister. Well, unlike the good senator, I don't operate under the delusion that people around the Christmas lunch table are going to be thinking about politics. But anyway, <laughs> what I would say this: if they did, if they did, what they would know is that there is a party that has consistently supported lower wage, late wage rises, lower wages, for nearly a decade. That there is a party that has proudly supported low wages as a deliberate Minister, design feature of the Australian Minister, economy. Minister, there's a party, uh, there Wong, a party please, who opposed Minister the dollar Wong. an hour increase to the minimum wage, a party who opposed wage increases Minister for aged Wong, care workers and seat. early childhood educate. Minister Wong. Senator O'Sullivan. Yes, uh, Acting Deputy President, I move to take note of the answers given to all coalition senators' questions. Uh, the first one went to uh, transparency, and then we had some questions about the cost of living. And I seek to uh, cover off on all of those in my taking note this morning, uh, this evening, uh, this afternoon. <laughs> rather, it has, it has been a long week, though. Uh, and. Uh, the, fir the first one on transparency, and what we've seen with this government is a pattern of a lack of transparency. Yet we heard time and time again throughout the election campaign and in the lead up to it that this government, the hallmark of this government, would be transparency, uh, would be uh, uh, open to scrutiny, would be in and have integrity. But we're seeing anything but that so far. I mean, I needed to take a look at the inquiry that went into, the, uh, into this fair work bill that the, that the government is currently debating. 
a lack of transparency, a lack of scrutiny. They only allowed 22 days for stakeholders to be able to uh, present their concerns and their issues about the bill that is before this parliament. 22 days to consider such a, a significant and uh, such a significant uh, uh, change to the Fair Work Bill, and this is just absolutely outrageous. Because this government is not prepared to open themselves up to scrutiny. Because if you did, then you would find that there would be all sorts of holes, and that's what we're finding as the uh, as we're in the committee stage of this uh, of that particular bill. Uh, but here we have a situation where uh, we have uh, a, a request for uh, for details of diaries to be revealed to be tabled to, so that uh, the, the parliament can, can scrutinise, so that members of parliament can, uh, can scrutinise whereabouts uh, and, and who the uh, various ministers are, are engaging with. And the Prime Minister is not allowing, has not provided his diary so that the Australian people can have a look, so that this parliament can have a look at what is going on. That, now, this is, this is very disappointing and it's a very concerning uh, precedence that's been set here. Uh, and even the, the, the leader of the, the government in this place is not, uh, not uh, making her diary available. And I look forward to it being available. I've got no doubt that uh, Senator Wong is uh, engaging in some very important issues, engaging in her portfolio with some very uh, important issues. But, but why, why not open it up? Why not fulfil the obligation that they have to be transparent and to be honest with the open up and be, be transparent with the Australian people. Now, to the cost of living, uh, the, the, we had some questions about this and we had some very, well, would you call, would you call them answers, uh, colleagues? I'm not sure that they were really answers because they were just ducking and weaving from the reality. Now, we heard uh, time and time and time again, over 90 times throughout the election campaign alone, that this government was going to tackle energy prices, was going to, in fact, uh, reduce the cost of energy by $275 to the Australian people. It was promised to the Australian people, Mr Acting Deputy, uh, Mr Deputy President, it was promised to the Australian people that that would happen, but it's not. In fact, what we're seeing is that Australians are going to be worse off under this government. In fact, $2,000 worse off by the time we get to Christmas. And as I asked in my question to the, to the minister representing the Prime Minister what, what the impact was going to be, we know that Australians, when they're buying their, their hams and their turkeys and their bonbons and getting themselves ready for hosting a Christmas lunch with their family, as they are I'm sure, been looking forward to for so long, and we know that last Christmas, Many families were apart and weren't able to get together. They're looking forward to getting together this Christmas. But uh, what they're seeing as they're going to the grocery stores is the cost of delivering Christmas this year has gone up. The cost of buying those presents for kids has gone up because what we're seeing is that this government's not doing anything to tackle the cost of living crisis that is before us right now. Inflation is going up, interest rates are going up, the cost of delivering Christmas is going up. And I look forward to the responses of those other opposite who might be able to rebut what I'm saying because there's not, there's nothing that they can say, there's nothing that they can point to, there's nothing that they can point to that will demonstrate that they're actually doing something to address this cost of living crisis. Now, I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, a very Merry Christmas. I hope that you do get to celebrate some great time with your family. I hope that you do get to enjoy a lovely Christmas lunch, because I know that many Australians last year didn't get to enjoy that, and I hope that they get that chance, even though it's costing them more. Senator Billick. Thank you, um, Deputy President. Seriously, give the man a bucket and a hanky. Seriously, the crocodile tears are just beyond beyond humour, it is beyond humour, because this is the side that want to come in here and give us a lecture on transparency. Transparency? I'm still waiting to see Mr Joyce's um, report when he was the envoy for whatever he was the envoy for, that he was paid enormous amounts of money for, that still nobody's ever been able to see. I mean, I'm still waiting to see the reports 
that you know you don't give us. And what else have we got? Let's talk about transparency on the other side. First of all, we've got the former Attorney General. So that you know that side, integrity, um, just you know that. I beg your pardon. I do know where the government. I know you lost the election, and you know why you lost the election because people knew you were not up to the job. People knew that you didn't care about them. People knew that you didn't care about the cost of living. And the crocodile tears from over there, and we're spending hours in here because you won't support the industrial relations bill. You won't give low-paid workers a pay rise. You will not give the aged care workers a pay rise. You will not give the early childhood educators a pay rise. Your whole policy on pay rise was to keep wages low. Was to keep wages low. And what do you have? It's like I don't know if anyone in the gallery threw you, um, Deputy President, but I don't know if anyone in the gallery ever watched that show to the men are born. Because that's what, 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 we, what we have got over there. They through me, think Senator Billick, through th me, not the gallery. I did say through you, Deputy President. I know, but you were talking to the gallery. Well, through you, Deputy President, I will say, I will say to those over there, you've watched too much to the men are born. You think you are to the men are born. You want to keep wages low. You want to keep people down. Don't come in here and tell us that people won't be able to afford Christmas because we know that because we're cleaning up 10 years of your mess, 10 years of you guys deliberately keeping wages lower, 10 years of you de denying low paid workers an increase. Do you think people are fooled by that? I can tell you, I have early childhood educators in my office or in, in my office in Hobart probably at least twice a month. And I'll tell you, they do not like you guys, and I'm quite happy for them not to like you guys. They know that you are blocking this wage rise for them. They know that it is you. They know that it is you that is trying to hold Australia back. You, uh, look, I've got, I've got, look, I've got less than two minutes left, and I do want to say something nice at the end. Order to my but left. Order to my you, left. You are the guys that you know had colour-coded spreadsheets. I mean, where's the transparency in that? Where is the colour? Where is the where is the transparency in that? Don't come in here and talk complete rubbish. People outside this building know you're talking rubbish. They know that it's just a ploy to try and cover up because you're all in denial over there. I don't know how many times. I don't know why you don't put your hands up like this every time someone says, "What's well, our fault?" What's well, it our fault? Because we don't have to take responsibility because now you're the government. Well, guess what? You spent 10 years buggering up the community, buggering up Australia. Senator, Bi and, Se Senator Billy, please don't uh, use I'm that sorry, term. Deputy President. I find it offensive. Yeah, OK, Deputy President, I withdraw that. I'm, I apologise wholeheartedly. You spent 10 years screwing the people of Australia. I'm not sure that's much better. Uh, no, it's OK. Senator Come on, Senator, I've heard, Senator Hen I've heard Senator Henderson, all sorts I'm well of things aware. in this building. I can look after myself, thank you. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. I would ask the senator opposite to withdraw that really most offensive word. Thank you. Yes. Uh, descriptors than the one the senator used. Well, I think it was entirely not, in context. We all haven't lived as worldly lives as you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Billick, please, co please continue. Chamber, I'm happy to withdraw everything that was offensive to the people on that side. I'm very, you know, I'd hate to offend you. You've offended the people of Australia for the last nine years. But it's, you know, I can't say that. Well, fine, I'm happy to take the ruling from the Deputy President. We have been working hard, working hard in the past six months that we've been in Parliament. And what have we been doing? We've, oh, do you want to hear what we've done? We've been, let me start, we've been building a modern economy. We're not living in the 1950s. We are not living in the 1950s like those on that side want to do. We've been protecting the vulnerable. We've been building, rebuilding, rebuilding 
uh, international relationships, because we know what happened to international relationships from your side. Thank, thank you, Senator Billig. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, to paraphrase uh, a great film from the early noughties, why are you so obsessed with us? All we have heard today from those in the government is uh, their own views on what happened when we were in government. There wasn't much constructive, uh, much, much con many constructive ideas at all coming from members of the government today, and I think that's really disappointing. We are seven months into this government now, into this new parliament, and the broken promises are starting to stack up. The problems are out there. Australians are under the pump. And we have a government that promised one thing in May, and if best, they do something entirely different, and at worst, they don't even address the problem to start with. Um, during the election campaign, uh, and while the now government was in opposition, Labor promised on multiple occasions that they would fix the rising cost of living. They said they had a plan. They promised that they would reduce inflation. They promised that they would help Australians get household budgets under control. They promised that the average Australian could expect to see a $275 reduction in their power bills, and they promised that they would be a transparent and accountable government. It all sounded so easy, and they promised an easy fix. But it turns out that governing the country isn't as easy as some of those opposite expected, and maybe that's why they come into this place and, instead of talking about what they should be doing, they just talk about their perceived issues with this previous government. Right now, under Anthony Albanese and Labor, we have an economy with high inflation, rapidly rising interest rates and skyrocketing rising costs of living. But their dismal economic management and failure to deliver what they promised doesn't stop there. Like I said, Mr Deputy President, Labor have also abandoned their promise to reduce household electricity prices for Australians, a promise which they said would save the average Australian $275 on their power bill. Oh, thank you, Senator Birmingham and Senator Scar, for the interjections there. I, um, this uh, late on a sitting week, I didn't have the number uh, quite front of mind, but the number I did have front of mind is 275, because that's how many dollars they said your electricity bill was going to go down by. Instead of saving for households, the government's been forced to make an embarrassing admission that over the next two years, Australians can expect to see electricity prices go up by 56 per cent. People voted for Mr Albanese and Labor based off this promise. And the question is, what is Labor going to do about it? But the fact is, they do not have a plan. That is why we saw this uh, behaviour from the government today. They will talk as much as they like about the last nine years uh, and their various views on, um, on our government, but six months in, they can't actually on focus on the issues that are important to Australians. And not even Labor state governments believe that the Albanese government has a plan that's going to work, let alone a plan that's going to deliver that $275 promise. Um, I was paging through the Financial Review yesterday and we read that uh, the South Australian government was appealing to the Federal Energy Minister not to do anything stupid. Well, it's a bit late for that. Uh, most people would say that promising every Australian household that their power bills would go down by hundreds of dollars to win an election and then announcing in your first budget that bills will actually be going up by hundreds of dollars is a fairly stupid thing to do, Mr Deputy President. The Albanese government's plan to put a cap on gas prices faces a new roadblock, with the South Australian Labor government joining industry warnings that it could deter investment in new gas supply developments. That was the report in the Fin yesterday. And this came on the same day that the Queensland Labor government told the Albanese government to keep its hands off their generators. Not even Labor governments trust other Labor governments to bring down power prices. The dishonesty that was on display by the Labor Party earlier this year when they promised Australians they would lower the cost of living is extraordinary. When they promised Australians they'd get a $275 cut to their power bills, millions of people believed them. They believed them when they said that they were going to be a government that was about transparency and accountability, and yet this week in this place they tried to take uh, days out of our Senate estimates sitting schedule for next year. I mean, you can't be um, much less interested in transparency and accountability than that, than taking away the ability of this chamber to scrutinise the decisions of government. 
Uh, instead of a $275 cut, Labor have brought out a budget promising Australian households a 56 per cent hike to their power bills, and now we are seeing Labor state governments fighting with the federal government about these very same issues. It's not good enough. Six months in, it's a pretty disappointing result for the government. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, the opposition's lack of transparency has followed them right into opposition and into this question time. They have failed to nail, uh, nail the government at all when they raise these issues because we have been very fair and transparent in our commitments to the Australian people. But if you look even at how the opposition asked their questions today, when Senator Cadell asked Senator Wong, saying, I refer to your secret modelling that demonstrates that there'll be coal mine enclosures as a result of your policies, lo and behold, what do we find through you, <laughs> Deputy President? Those very coal mines were forecast to close and that their closure was announced under the last government. So far from being attributable to the Labor Party's uh, policy commitments and, indeed, the commitments we have made to the Australian people, we saw those forecast job losses under the opposition's policy settings from when they were in government. The po opposition's complete lack, frankly, of policy settings, as we've heard Many times in this place we, we saw under the last government some 22 energy policies in the time that they were in government. So when we talk about our commitment to preventing job losses on the road to net zero, we're serious about it. That's why we do this modelling, so we can see the impact of our policies on local employment markets, and we can work out where you stimulate in order to mitigate uh, any changes in those local job mar markets in order to prevent those job losses. We've also had from those opposite a debate today about cost of living. Well, the key contributor, one of the key contributors to cost of living in this nation has, of course, been electricity prices, gas prices, things that you didn't do anything about in terms of your absolute lack of policy clarity on those questions. Again, a mess that we in government are now left to clean up. Those opposite like to lambast us for our um, target our reduction target of emission for emissions. And we've talked about uh, the Hunter and other coal mining precincts. Well, we're proud to be a government that is working with the government of New South Wales. Currently, that's the Liberal government. They have a reduction target uh, to get to a 50% reduction by 2030. Are you blaming them for, these, for, for this landscape? Are you making accusations of them that attributes job losses to them? Well, no, because we know that these reduction policies are both good for our environment and good for the economy. They're not easy transitions to make. They have complex adjustments for economies and communities that we need to be smart and organised about. But the economic modelling and indeed the historical record, when you look at things like the short time we had the carbon pollution reduction scheme in place, or you look, if you look at the success of existing renewable energy technologies uh, widely used in Australia, uh, and their costings. It demonstrates that our modelling and our commitments absolutely stack up. We are a government who wants to look after workers because we care about the cost of living. 
We are here today in this chamber spending most of the day debating industrial relations laws. Industrial relations laws that will empower workers and workplaces to work with their employers to improve productivity and increase wages and conditions where they're deserved. Thank, thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, well, uh, it's only been four weeks uh, since the Labor government's first budget, and uh, that budget uh, wasn't so much about their own figures, but it was a, had a shocking impact on the budgets of average Australian families. Uh, in that budget, it was revealed that uh, energy prices for Australian families in the next two years are set to skyrocket by 56%. And there has been a massive community outrage at this, especially given the government only six months before had promised to actually slash uh, people's power bills by $275. Now, since then, in the past four weeks, the government has, has flown uh, more kites than you'd see on a windy beach. Uh, every day there is a new kite being flown about what they're going to do uh, about energy prices, despite them saying they had a plan six months ago to actually deal with it. And now, and I'm only speaking to some of major uh, uh, energy companies this morning here in this place, they are shaking their head. They are shaking their head at this government because they have no idea what they are going to do. No idea what they're going to do. Every day, basically, they wake up, they read the paper and they read about the latest uh, battles that are going on with this divided government, with this government with no direction on how they're going to get people's uh, energy bills down. I think it's important to go through uh, this absolute rabble that this government is over the past month. On the 28th of October in 2022, in the New Daily, on the New Daily website, there was a, a, a story that said, Labor refuses to rule out gas export cap. And it says former competition watchdog boss Rod Sims has suggested the government threatened gas providers with export limits. Energy Minister Chris Bowen didn't rule out such a drastic move. So that's on the table. They have no idea if there's going to be a gas export tap, uh, cap. We still don't know. Then, uh, on the 26th of October, uh, uh, The Australian reported in a headline, windfall levy and changes to GST ruled out. And it said Jim Chalmers has ruled out changes to the GST or hitting gas exporters with a windfall profits tax. Now, only about two weeks later, after the Treasurer, nonetheless, the Treasurer had ruled out a windfall profits tax, just two weeks later, The Australian reported, front page on the 11th of November, that headlined, Labor risks new row with miners over coal gas tax. And the, and the article said, Anthony Albanese has not ruled out a new tax on gas and coal to help ease energy prices for households and businesses and said the government is, and I quote, working through the issue. Now, I wonder if Mr Albanese had spoken to his treasurer just two weeks before who had ruled out such a tax. I mean, what the hell is going on with this government? Why can't they get things in order? We are talking about extremely serious matters that they are messing around with because they have no idea what they're doing. Now, a few weeks on, by the 29th of November, a story in the, AB, uh, sorry, story in the Australian came up with a new idea. New idea. Anthony Albanese's fix for electricity bills, direct subsidies for homes and businesses. This was the third energy plan in just a few weeks uh, that was floated this week. And also, on the same day, on the very same day, the ABC uh, reported that government to cap wholesale gas prices as part of a market invention to lower power prices. So we actually had, that was a record, they had two energy policies on the same day that were briefed out to different newspapers and no one has any idea what they are doing, nonetheless themselves. They have no idea what they are doing here. They made promises, uh, in the words of uh, Maverick, they, they, they tried to cash cheques that their body can't keep uh, six months ago at the election. They said they could cut our power bills by $275 and they got to government they go, they have got no idea how to do this. Uh, and instead we're facing skyrocketing power bills ahead of Christmas this year. Well, this government has to, once we leave this place, they've got to get their act together because the Australian people rely on it. They need to get some consistency in their energy policies, not this rabble that's going on uh, playing out in our nation's newspapers. They need to talk to these energy producers, they need to talk to the industrial customers and most of all they need to talk to the Australian people. And none of this, none of this, none of this weasel words, this corporatese that they've been using as was revealed, was said again by their leader today saying that they're going to transition, they're going to transition workers to new jobs. Uh, that means you're going to lose your job. People know that. When they hear the word transition, that means I'm going to lose my job. And if that's what you mean, just say it. 
Just say it. It's a lot more trustworthy when you say that because when you use words like transition, you sound, you sound like a second-rate HR manager at, at a large business. Uh, you, sound like, you sound like that character from the Dilbert cartoon, the catbird. You're all a bunch of catbirds over there when you use words like transition instead of speaking plainly to the Australian people. Because if I know anything about coal miners in this country, they don't take kindly uh, to, be, to, to, the, to the rubbish, to the BS that goes on sometimes uh, from this other mob. Just speak the truth to us and be honest. Thank you, Senator Canavan. I put the question. Those for the question say aye against. No, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, De uh, Acting Deputy um, President. I move to take note of the government's response to my question regarding climate change and loss and damage. Um, and I also note that Senator Wish Wilson will also take part of my time. Um, in 1991, Vanuatu, on behalf of small island states, first asked this question, <coughs> who will pay for climate catastrophe? And over the next three decades, wealthy nations of the global north dodged and deflected that question, while they continued to fuel the climate crisis. They relentlessly pursued profit and power and put the world on track for climate catastrophe and disasters. And these disasters have affected 33 million people in Pakistan, 50 million people in the Horn of Africa face the threat of famine. The climate crisis is, exist, is an existential threat to the Pacific nations. After decades of pushing by the Global South, a loss and damage fund has finally been agreed to. And New Zealand, Denmark, Germany and Scotland have all committed to contributing. But Australia still refuses to commit its fair share to loss and damage funding. Today, the climate change minister tabled his first annual climate change statement and mentioned the devastating floods in Pakistan, as well as the climate risks faced by Indonesia and the Pacific Islands. But it's simply not enough for the government to acknowledge these climate catastrophes and grave climate risks faced by countries of the global south. It needs to stop pouring fuel on fire. It beggars belief that the climate change minister did not once mention the words coal or gas, not a single time. Honestly, what does the government think is causing the crisis in the first place? Strong and urgent action means no new coal and gas. It is untenable to keep sacrificing the lives and livelihoods of those in poorer nations to maintain the profit margins of fossil fuel conglomerates, many of whom fill Political, political donation buckets for both the big parties. Now, climate change is a matter of global justice. Those who did nothing to create it are facing the first and the worst consequences. Loss and damage funding is about compensation and a debt owed for the terrible legacy of extractivism and colonialism by the global north. It is not charity. It is about righting historic wrongs. Given Australia's dirty hands in producing carbon emissions, we have a special responsibility to do everything we can for climate justice. Australia needs to use its diplomatic weight to push for the loss and damage fund to be set up urgently and take the lead by unequivocally committing to loss and damage funding and pay its fair share. That's what real climate leadership on the global stage looks like. That's what listening to our Pacific neighbours looks like. And that's what global justice demands of us. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy, Deputy President, not only has the government not answered Senator Fruki's question today on climate change, but they've also not complied with an order of this Senate to provide details, critical details, uh, on their formal response to the IUCN UNESCO reactive monitoring mission report, which they were happy to release earlier this week. They seem to be very big on rhetoric and very light on detail. Um, Minister Plibersek has sat on this report for at least three months. She very, you know, very craftily put the response out this week, nicely massaged, given to uh, her favourite uh, media outlets. We know how it all works. Uh, no doubt also uh, spoke to stakeholders and gave them a, a sneak preview of it. Uh, and we hear the response from the government. It wasn't, of course, the report wasn't what they wanted to hear. Uh, the IUCN UNESCO uh, committee recommended that the Great Barrier Reef should be put on the in danger list because its outstanding universal values are going to be severely impacted from climate change. And of course, it recommended 
that the government meet its Paris protocols. Well, why doesn't the government comply with the order of this Senate and provide its official, its official explanation to UNESCO? Did, for example, the government say that they are going to meet their Paris targets? Because we know they have legislated a climate target in this place, with no detail or plan on how they're going to meet it, by the way, that it well exceeds our Paris commitments. We know they don't have a plan for that. Where is that detail? What else did they say to UNESCO? Did they say it's unfair that the Barrier Reef's been singled out amongst all the world's coral reefs that are suffering because of warming oceans caused by the burning of fossil fuels? Well, what kind of excuse is that to actually say the Barrier Reef shouldn't be singled out? What we should be doing is showing leadership and saying that's why the reef should be put on the endanger list so that we can all take action right around the world and understand the gravity of the situation that we and future generations are facing. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it.